Okay, sure. I think we're all yours. Are we all are we all ready to go? Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Hopefully we have many of you joining us and will be joining us in the next few moments of the second in our inaugural um, session of Book Club. So if you were lucky enough to join us the first time or have listened to the video, you will recognise the faces that we have here. We have Emeritus Professor Jill White, who is joining us all the way from Sydney, Australia. And we have our author, Sarah De Gregorio, who is joining us from New York in the US. And myself, Aisha Holloway, who is joining from um, a very dark and dreary night in Scotland in the UK. So welcome, everyone. I know some of you are um, joining us from various parts of the, of the universe. And tonight, as I say, we will have our second session. For those of you who maybe don't know our guest this evening, I will just give you a little short bio, but if you want more information, you can find it. There is plenty on the internet there. So I'm going to start with Jill, who is um, one of my, I would say, iconic figures in nursing. I was telling my students today in class that I used to look, look to Jill and I thought if I ever meet this person, um, I will be overwhelmed because of how wonderful she is and her interest in policy and what she's done around that for nursing as well as many other things. And I'm pleased to say that we did meet each other. I did manage to speak to her several years ago and she's a wonderful colleague and friend. So Professor White was the Dean of Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Sydney from 2008 to 15. And prior to this, she was Dean of Faculty at the University of Technology, Sydney, 1997 to 2008. And the most wonderful thing about many of the accolades and achievements that Jill received, she was a Fulbright Senior Scholar at Penn University. She was seconded to ICN as Associate Director of Global Education. But more importantly, she helped develop one of the first university nursing programs in Australia and chaired Australia's largest health professional regulatory body. Um, she has done many other things. And in 2011, she was awarded the member of the Order of Australia Medal in the Australia Day Honours List for Services to Nursing and Midwifery. And she continues those services. Most recently, she sat on the board of the Nursing Now Global Campaign, and we are lucky enough to have her as an advisory member of the Nursing Now Challenge. So welcome, Jill, and thank you for your contribution and wonderful reflections and uh, conversation with Sarah in our first and hopefully for this evening also. And then we have Sarah, who has become an, not just an honorary nurse, but um, much more than that since the publication of her book. Sarah is a journalist and author, and she has written um, a couple of critically acclaimed books, Early, An Intimate History of Premature Birth, and then this most recent publication around nursing, Taking Care, The Story of Nursing and Its Power to Change Our World. And She's been a keynote speaker for national audiences such as the American Nurses Association, the National Association for Neonatal Nurses, the Bioethics Centre at Children's Mercy Kansas City, Seattle Children's Hospital, Rutgers University, and it goes on. And she also, interestingly, for those of you who maybe don't know, has a side gig as a recipe developer for the New York Times Cooking. So if you're ever in the area and you're looking for a lovely meal, that's the place to go. Um, she has a wonderful husband, daughter, two cats and a dog. And um, as I say, we are lucky enough to have her with us this evening. So I am now going to just mention a little bit about our first book club. If you haven't already, please listen to it. It's on the Nursing Now um, YouTube channel. If you're not sure, we can pop the link into the chat this evening. But please watch that because it will really set the scene very well for this evening, but you don't have to watch that to listen to the conversation tonight. But what we learned from the first session was that Sarah's book was hugely well evidenced and researched and took us on a journey of 
I guess, reflection about our profession, its origins, the key issues that challenge us every day as nurses. But I think the most honourable and wonderful thing about the book is that Sarah, as a non-nurse, has been able to articulate many of the issues and challenges that we face, has gained insight and been able to articulate about our identity, where we come from, and I guess where we're going to in the future and the potential that we have. And we're going to carry on these conversations so eloquently stimulated by Jill this evening. And Sarah will read some extracts from the book. Jill will probably perhaps do the same. And it is wonderful. My advice would be get yourself a lovely cup of tea, coffee or cold drink, sit back and let this wash all over you because it will change your perception of who you are as a nurse. And it might very well be emotional. The last one was particularly towards the end because of how wonderful this conversation has been. So enjoy it and tell all your colleagues if they haven't listened to this once we record it and it's available, please do so now. I'm going to hand over to our two wonderful guests and colleagues and I will um, take my leave, but we will be watching for questions in the chat and there will be an opportunity for your questions to be put to um, Sarah and Jill um, towards the end of the evening. Thank you so much for joining us and for your time and for listening. And I hope this is a memorable evening. Thanks, Aisha. Um, I had no idea you were going to read all of that. I'm, I'm sorry for people having to, to listen to quite so much. Um, it's not, all not true. I believe that. it. Inspirational. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and and thanks for th those who are putting their who they are and and where they're listening from, um, or watching from in the chat because I've seen that I have some colleagues from Australia who are watching, and we've got people from many many different countries. So um, we love it when we see those uh, pop up on the on the chat um, down the bottom. So um, so thank you, and continue to do that, and don't forget about the questions. Now, rather than, you know, I'm going to assume that the majority of you have either either were listening in real time to our last conversation <clears throat> or have uh, caught up on it. If you haven't, please do, but don't, don't worry. I just want to recap on a, a, a couple of the beginning points that locate us. So um, I want to read uh, one of the very beginning uh, pieces of, uh, of the book, where Sarah says, and I quote, but every now and then someone in that Latin, now, sorry, I should have said to you, one of the things that attracted me into the book the first time I read it was that Sarah spoke about the inhumane um, labyrinth that is the that was her experience of the US healthcare system. So picking up on that notion of in, in human uh, labyrinth, every now and then someone in that labyrinth managed to see you, hear you, and offer exactly what you need. For me, these encounters stand out with crystalline clarity. They were moments of relief. Someone was going to help us. Someone could help us. And even when that help didn't inc include a cure, even when there wasn't a fix, Almost every single time, the person who offered what it was that we needed was a nurse. I've come to understand that that wasn't a coincidence. And hence Sarah's book and one of the descriptors she uses of the book is that it's a love story to nursing's vast possibilities. Now, I tell you, that just zeroes in to me. And we're going to return to that phrase later. Um. Sarah, you, you position uh, nursing not as commonly positioned as beginning with Florence Nightingale and British nursing, but rather in your book, you take the point that, and I quote, nursing is a thread running through all human history. Nurses were at the events that defined our world. So, Sarah, I wonder, hello, how are you? Sorry, I hadn't, hadn't um, done that bit to start with, but I'm... Um, Sarah and I have talked for 15 minutes beforehand, so um, hence hence the uh, forgetting to say, say good day. 
as we would say in Australia. Sarah, I wonder if you might read that um, from that section that relates to nursing's history, um, starting with the historians and anthropologists. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, of course. And thank you, Jill. And good day to you. Um, and everybody here, I just want to say how much I appreciate the opportunity to speak with Jill and with all of you. And thank you, Aisha, for that very kind introduction. It's my honor to be here. Um, and I appreciate it very much. So <clears throat> the, the passage that Jill is talking about goes like this. Historians and anthropologists often point to pivotal moments that distinguished the evolution of early humans. When we started making tools or decorative objects or using fire to cook or when we cooperated by sharing food. But what about the impulse to staunch someone's bleeding? What about helping someone give birth? What about sitting up with someone who was dying? These are interactions that define humans as much as the use of tools, fire, and agriculture. I think that's a fantastic passage and a, and a, a really interesting thought about the fact that what we do has always been done by someone named whatever. Um, and, and I know for those of you who were listening to the first chat, I know that's a repetition of, of um, you know, Sarah said that at the last one, but I think it's an anchoring point for this conversation. And we saw in the early chapters of the book, the development of nursing was by no means linear. It was forged through all of the social, cultural and political circumstances within countries and progressively as we became more globalised globally. This intersection of nursing and politics and power is going to be the focus of this conversation. Um, so we're primarily looking today at chapters three, and which is on, on identity, and 10, which is in fact called power. Um, I have to say that's not, to dis that's not in any way to dismiss the chapters that go between three and 10. Um, many of those chapters are developing the story that gets to 10. Um, many of them use wonderful exemplars of nursing predominantly in the United States. So one of the challenges I want to throw out to people is that as you read chapters four to nine, try and think of similar exemplars within your own country. So chapter three on identity is subtitled, Who's a Nurse? the wartime struggle for the right to care. And here, Sarah, you immediately um, find the deeply contextual nature of nursing, who's allowed to care, who can call themselves a nurse, and how these aspects change as the need for nursing changes. And you use Nightingale as a potent exemplar of this. Um, nursing in Britain had predominantly been undertaken by women of lower socioeconomic status, educated higher status women were rarely able to work outside the house even. And the political situation was such that something had to be done about the health of the soldiers. And through family connections, Florence Nightingale knew the minister who was in charge of the war effort. Um, <clears throat> and so she was asked to take this group of experienced, respectable white women to uh, Scutari. And you say, and I quote, Nightingale knew she'd been hired to lead a political experiment and that some of the British Army physicians would, be, would have been happy to see her fail. <clears throat> I wonder if, elaborating on this, you might read the bit about um, Nightingale, what she was navigating. Yes, absolutely, I will. Um, and this is, um, this is on page 47. <clears throat> so... Nightingale was navigating Victorian anxieties around propriety, hierarchy, and women's work outside the home, all on behalf of the British government and in a war zone. Nightingale was consumed with the desire to succeed, and she responded to the delicacy of her political situation with absolute deference to the British social order. She wanted badly to prove that some women, certain trained, sober, proper, white Christian women, could be a new kind of nurse, essential to the health of the nation. Really interesting, isn't it? 
Um, yeah. And really important that we know that political citing of what it was that she did and what it was that she could do. Um, and you go on to say that she, Nightingale, changed the system from so far inside it that she ended up replicating it exactly. Um, and you go on to say the fact that Nightingale's nurses replicated the restrictive social structures is what made it durable. Now, that's a really interesting point. Perhaps this is because nursing in reality is so intimate, so relationship-based, so resistant to strict categorization and hierarchy, so rooted in the moments of universal vulnerability that it's potentially subversive. Wow. Especially when done by people of all backgrounds, races and classes. Think of C. Cold making cakes, prescribing medicines, learn from her Jamaican mother, not waiting for permission. Nightingale tamed nursing. And for some people, that was a great relief. Can you elaborate on what you mean here and what you think the consequences of that have been, both for nursing and for health systems? Yeah, such a good question. So I think to really think about this, it's helpful to go back actually even further than where we started here um, to the, the Middle Ages and the advent of medical schools. And um, medical schools in the Western European context um, started to spring up in the Middle Ages, and they were only for men, with the notable exception of the University of Salerno. Um, it was only for men. It was only for men of means. Now, these university educated physicians were coming into a healthcare healthcare landscapes that already existed, right? It's not that there was no healthcare or there was no system. There was a system. People had, um, there was, there was all, you know, all different kinds of cultural contexts for provision of healthcare. So there were, you know, in many countries, there were religious orders that provided healthcare. There were community experts who had learned by doing, so learning through apprenticeship. Um, there were um, healthcare providers who were men and women, and I do think very, I feel very strongly that you can trace a very distinct nursing ethos all the way back to prehistory, as we talked about. But the fact is, is that before these um, new medical schools, the distinctions between the kinds or among the different kinds of um, healthcare professions just wasn't as salient. So the idea that you were only a physician, you're only a nurse, you're only um, a pharmacist, or you're only a midwife even, um, those kinds of delineations were not as strict. Um, and so it was much more of a, I would say, a, um, a community-based healthcare economy where credibility really came from word of mouth and this idea that, you know, we know that this woman down the street, she helps everyone give birth, or we know that the nuns in this, um, in this particular um, nunnery are great with herbs for X, Y, Z. Um, and so there was a building of expertise. There was a healthcare landscape and when the university educated physicians came on the scene, they had to sort of make a case that they were different and that they were, that they actually had access to this knowledge that nobody else had um, and that their knowledge was more important and was, um, was a higher form of knowledge than what the other irregular practitioners had, right? And so this, I think you can make a case that this, at least in the Western European context, is really the beginning of what came to be our modern healthcare hierarchy, which often and falsely, I would very strongly argue, positions physicians at the top and everyone else as sort of supporting characters. So if you think about that, think about this landscape that, um, that Nightingale was coming into, which, um, which was really this evolution of the idea that physicians were men, they were learned men of means, um, and everyone else, you know, women by definition were practicing without a license, or they were, you know, if they were trying to, um, there, there were many different sort of statutes in different places. But for instance, a good example of this was a statute in Spain that said that 
women could continue to practice, but only if they were um, caring for children and if they didn't give any potions. So they couldn't charge for medicines. You know, it, they really needed to position their expertise very much in um, a domestic sense and not in, you know, um, not, not to compete with these new physicians. So I think that what you see with Nightingale, and I, I want to be very clear that, you know, we're talking about our entire healthcare hierarchy, like the modern healthcare hierarchy. And so all of this can't be placed at one woman's feet. But I think it's very, very uh, important to understand that what she put forward was, was attractive to people in power for a reason. And it became iconic because it was attractive to people in power. So she posited that, okay, um, well-to-do women actually have something to offer. Uh, this was a new idea for her time. Um, the idea that well-to-do women can work outside the home, have something to offer, and that nursing work wasn't just something that impoverished women did uh, because they had no choice. Uh, because what you saw after this sort of, after the rise of the physicians, the role of the nurse and the idea of the female practitioner really became quite degraded in the public consciousness. This idea, like we were talking about, of um, of Sari Gamp, um, Dickens's character, yeah. who is a nurse who's always drunk and terrible at her job. So here comes Nightingale to kind of, um, you know, uh, revamp um, the idea of a nurse as someone who's Christian, who's maybe well-to-do, um, who is, you know, very in this very structured, very, very um, hierarchical model of nursing um, that's completely separate from the male physicians, right? They are under the male physicians in the sense that they definitely take their orders from them, but they are separate. It is a separate, she posits it as a completely separate thing. It's only for women. It's in her in her mind, in her practice, I would say, it's only for white women. Uh, it's a very um, British colonial um, endeavor. Uh, and this yeah. was a, a product of her, um, of her time, but also of her social stature, of her education, all of that, right? And so I think that the, the problem with that now is that, you know, she she put forward an idea of nursing as, you know, if we think of nursing, nurses being only women, um, nursing being extremely hierarchical and really built into that hierarchy that we have now with the physician at the top. Um, and I think that this has caused a lot of problems. Um, there is often, I have heard in my reporting, a real emphasis on appearance, especially in clinical training. So the idea that, you know, if um, a nurse has natural black hair, that that can often be seen as a, somehow a problem in clinical training or visible tattoos, or, you know, your hair is dyed a certain color. That's not a, how a real nurse looks, right? And, um, and, and so I, you know, I'm not saying that one woman can be responsible for that, but I am saying that sort of this idea in the consciousness of a lot, you know, this idea of who is a nurse and what does a nurse look like? This, a lot of this can be traced to sort of her conception of a nurse. The other thing, and this thing is really a problem is the idea that nurses are women and nurses are only women. And I do think that this kind of essentializing um, has led to nurses and you know, again, I think I said this before, but I, you know, there is nothing wrong with an association with women. There's nothing wrong with an association with maternal caring. And I think individual nurses might find that generative in their work. However, nursing is not and has never been only for women. And when people think of it that way, they think of then, ah, yes, it's because women are natural caregivers. What does that mean? It means we don't value their expertise. We don't pay them well. We don't give them safety. We think, oh, they just do it because they do it. That's how, that's, that's just who she is. Um, and I think it's been bad for patients. I think it's bad for nurses. And I think it's, it's ultimately false. Uh, and yeah. so that's sort of how I think about that. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and it's really, um, a couple of other things I think from Nightingale's time that that have had some importance, um, important ramifications for is that she was incredibly interested in the colonies, 
and and so was from time to time asked to send her nurses to the colonies, um, one of which, of course, was Australia. And um, Lucy Osborne was sent out here um, and, and bought the Nightingale notion of nursing um, to Australia. She had a much more difficult time than um, she could possibly ever have foreseen. But she did set a stamp for what nursing looked like here. But I think the other thing superimposed on that was that Nightingale not only wrote about nursing and was given the money for the nursing school, not that by the time the nursing school came around, she even want, was interested in it. She was off on the army and she was off on um, hospital architecture. But in many ways, it was her interest in hospital architecture that has led to in many ways, I think, to the continued stamp, her stamp on things, you know, the Nightingale Ward. Certainly mm. when <clears throat> when I did my training at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, that hospital was built to Nightingale specifications. The, the senior doctor was in contact with Nightingale and, and the design of that hospital, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in, in Sydney, still has the hallmarks of um of nightingale's engagement there and therefore how care was practiced in this hierarchical way so yeah it it brings us to some of the you brought us absolutely to some of the key issues i think that now um we're starting to grapple more with you know issues of gender and class and and indeed you know racism where clearly in Australia, our Indigenous, our First Nations people had their own system of health and their own system of nursing dismissed primarily once this there was the export of um, UK nursing. Uh, and in that, in raising those issues of gender and class and race, Sari, I think you, you really put... The, uh, uh, and sometimes takes an outsider to hold the mirror. And I wonder if you could read that passage for us. That starts, but nurses themselves, where I think um, you really hold up that um, mirror to us. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I just want to sort of piggyback on what you just were talking about, about how First Nations had their own traditions. And of course, everybody did, right? That a functional, every functional society has organized ways to care for each other. Um, and what I think is sort of interesting about that is, and I don't think of the past before medical schools as some sort of like perfect, uh, it's it's not that by definition somehow, um, you know, more equal. I don't think it necessarily was at all, but uh, the idea of where does credibility come from and where does, um, where does sort of authority as a nurse come from? And the idea that it might come from actually the relationships that you have in the community. And it's not coming from top down because this, because you know, this very gate kept sort of hierarchical because I have this role. It's, you know, this idea that you prove, you get your authority and you have your credibility as because of the role you have in your community and the value that you have in that community. So anyway, that just made me think of that. I, 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 anyway, um, to the to the passage that you asked for, um, but nurses themselves do not always live up to their moral and ethical obligations to provide patient centered care without bias. Nursing has its own serious internal problems, and those problems profoundly affect nurses lives and their abilities to provide ethical care to the public. For instance, nursing has a very specific historical and present day problem with racism. A 2021 study found that a staggering 92% of black nurses, this is in the United States, say that they have personally experienced racism directed against them in the workplace from peer colleagues, nurse leaders, and patients in roughly equal numbers. Yes, we have, we have similar uh, alarming statistics here um and and it would be inappropriate for us i think to to, to white women um 
sitting here to, to talk, to try and delve too much into racism. So, in fact, we discussed this with with Asia and um, and uh, the Nursing Now Challenge is going to run a webinar on racism um, so that we can deal, deal with it, so that we can discuss it, so we can look at it, so we can shine the light on it um, uh, later in the year. And I think that's probably a, a much more a, a appropriate way of moving forward. So I hope you'll all engage in that in that webinar. But before we do move from there, I, I absolutely want to acknowledge the extraordinary work that's been done on racism, particularly by First Nations nurses in Canada and New Zealand, certainly in Australia, um, most of the places that the UK colonised. Um, I, I pay my respect and I honour what you're doing. Um, just back to Nightingale for a minute to move on to the notion of power, really. Um, Nightingale, I think, displayed what I what are the four key elements, really, of what power is about. And given that power, my definition of power is that power is the ability to influence decision making, particularly in relation to resources. You know, it's pretty simple. Often nurses say, you know, you hear nurses say, yeah, I don't want to talk about power. It's not our business. Our business is absolutely about where decisions are made about resource allocation and, um, and decision making. And, and Nightingale, you know, if you look at what she had, what she bought, she had that fabulous interest in statistics. You know, this was an incredibly well-educated woman who was fascinated by statistics and, in fact, as we know, developed the first graphic representation of data to make a political point. Um, she had the stories because she'd been at the coalface and she had an understanding of government and policy making because she was welded into that world. Her father, who predominantly educated her, um, had brought her along to meetings and, and, uh, and got her to debate with uh, with senior men, so she wasn't frightened of that, and in that, that way developed influential friends. So, mm -hmm. if you actually look at what she bought, it captures, you know, one of my favourite things as an old academic. I love frameworks. The, you know, some of you will know the Walton Gilson Triangle, but that notion that you have to have the context, so you have to have the stories, you have to know the context, you have to have the content, um, you have to, you know, really know your stuff. You have to have the process, understanding how decisions are made, and you have to know the actors. And just, you know, really um, quite quickly, when you look at that's what Florence had. If you look at um, Lucy Osborne, who was the uh, Nightingale nurse who was sent out to Australia, she didn't know the context. She wasn't an experienced nurse. She, she didn't know the processes of government in Australia. And um, and she was offside with most of the key actors. She still managed to stay here for 16 years and to, to make changes. But the difference in the ability to make policy changes and the ability to have power, um, I think, really resonates in, in that. Um, let's, let's jump 100 years um, and, and look really for, at another pandemic, post another pandemic. I mean, Florence Nightingale was post the flu and where we are now. So, Sarah, you say um, we sent we sent them pizzas and flowers and we called them our heroes and we meant it, but it wasn't what they needed. I think this is a really potent part of your book. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So I, you know, I was in New York City during the pandemic and... Um, I was actually writing this book. I had just gotten the contract to write this book. Um, and that was that was a very strange kind of uh, strange kind of synergy. Um, and, you know, every night around five o'clock, we would all go outside or we would, you know, go out our lean out our windows and people would clap or bang pots and pans for um, really for, I would say really for the nurses, because I do think that the anxiety and the fear, so much of it was around, you know, no one will, no one will touch me if I get sick. No one will be there when I, if I die. 
Um, certainly it was for, you know, it was for all healthcare providers, but I do think that there was a certain element of this that was, we knew um, that nurses were the ones who were putting themselves at most at, at greatest risk. And we also, I think, I think it, I think it was a moment where people thought more about what nursing work actually entails. And I was hopeful at the time that this would lead to like real change around um, how the public understands nurses and nursing knowledge. Um, but what I what I am really sad to sort of see in retrospect was this idea of you know us in the public being very thwarted in our ability to, um, you know, express our gratitude, but also um, I mean I think you know that we wanted to we wanted to express gratitude in a way that was. Um, that was meaningful. And we wanted, um, we wanted to have some kind of agency in that. And I think that the problem was that um, the public has never really, has I think been sort of kept from understanding what nurses do and how they do it and what they know. And therefore we were left with only emotion and no agency whatsoever. And so, yes, we had this ritual and maybe the ritual was for us and it wasn't for the nurses at all because what the nurses needed was PPE. And what the nurses needed was, you know, a safe working environment. Um, and that's not what they had. <laughs> and um, I find this, I actually, I just, you know, honestly, I just find this so upsetting in retrospect, um, because I think that there was this moment where things really could have been different because there was this massive, massive, very real emotion for this. Yeah. Um, uh, but because the system exists the way it exists and because we don't, um, at least in the United States, we have so little insight into how our healthcare system works and we have so little agency in changing it. Um, that in reality, all we were able to do was send green cards and pizza. And truly, that was not what nurses needed. And there actually was a sense of anger amongst nurses that, you know, how can they think that this is what we need? It's like they don't understand what we're doing. And so there was this incredible mismatch, just a total, you know, um, and I find it actually just very upsetting in retrospect. I think that's that that mismatch really is a subject that that needs to be very deeply explored because it really did show the lack of understanding of the public of of what nurses do and and and, and as you say of, of what we need and i'm very mindful that you know boris johnson the, at the time um you know the boss of the uk um <clears throat> got COVID and he said, he came out and he said, you know, I want to acknowledge particularly to call out two nurses. And and in his words, he showed that he actually saw what it was that nurses did. You know, they were watching, they were thinking, they were making decisions. They And, you know, and, and there was a cartoon in the nursing standard of nurses holding a recorder saying, we're recording his words to play them back to the government when all this is over. Now, we've seen what's happened with nursing in the UK, sadly, since, since that moment where it's so quickly forgotten and we're back into dominance of economic policy, blah, blah. Um, oh, I, I want to read uh, some of the, your words here where you say uh, COVID-19 might have been a novel virus, but the pandemic played out in ways that showed how the past is not always the past, not at all past. <clears throat> who was protected and who was not, who was expected to sacrifice. These false archetypes persist. Caring is done by indentured girls. It's done by enslaved women. It's done by nuns. It's done by mothers and by witchy old women. Um, quite. <laughs> um, you go on to talk then about patient safety. Um, and I wonder if you might 
read that quote that we discussed in relation to um, to that notion of nurses and patient safety. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I will also add that I was so struck by reading historical accounts of other pandemics, you know, um, syphilis, the syphilis um, epidemic that swept across Asia and Europe, um, and how there was, you know, there was this idea that the nurses, that they, if it, they could recruit young, impoverished women to be nurses during this pox epidemic, that somehow that would purify, that there was a purification element that we would, that they, they would be saved from prostitution and become nurses instead. And that not only then were they doing the actual hands-on work of caring for people who were ill, but also they were serving as these kind of um, figurative sacrifices that they were purifying the community from this vice um, and uh, and I think that so much of that is it, it, obviously the particulars are different, but so much of that remains relevant. You know, the idea of whose sacrifice is um, yeah. is wanted, and who who's who is asked to sacrifice to save us. You know. Yes. Yes. So, yes. yes. Young girls. Yeah. Women. Young girls. Yeah. Women. Um, so this passage, and so this connects, I think, very directly with with staffing and workplace conditions um, in a way, and this, I think, is the disconnect that the public maybe needs to understand better. When nurses say they are striking for patient safety, it might sound like just another slogan, but available evidence shows that it is true that the devaluing of nursing is the devaluing of human lives. It means that someone in charge has tallied up the expenses and decided to make cuts they know will result in worse health for patients. When nurses make this case to the public, it is a powerful message. It is no wonder so much effort has been expended to keep them quiet. And and you go on to make what I think is one of the one of the sentences of the book, um, where you say nursing is political simply because health and caring are deeply linked to how a nation chooses to treat its citizens. Um, what wow. Uh, I, I think that's that, that's um that really um, makes such a statement for nurses to think about and think about their role in <clears throat> in not just being concerned with the nurse patient dyad, you know, the nurse and the patient, but to understand <clears throat> that at every layer above that, right up to you know national and global health. Decisions are made that utterly impact on um, on what you can do with the person that you're caring for, um, and and you go on to give a beautiful example of this with a woman called India Walton, um, Sarah, where you talk about how the nurse lifts out of just seeing her immediate environment and realizes that just seeing it isn't enough something has to happen and I wonder can you can you run us through India Walton's uh, story please yeah yeah um so India Walton was a NICU nurse and that's where we're starting with her here Walton left the NICU to become a school nurse in Buffalo Public Schools there, she noticed that most of the kids who ended up in her office didn't have a simple physical ailment that she could treat, a stomach bug, a scrape from a playground fall, strep throat. Instead, it was more like this. There was the little girl who had lice. Walton told her mom that if she shampooed the girl's hair with delousing shampoo that evening, she could come back to school the next day. The mother said this would be impossible. She didn't get paid until Friday, so she couldn't buy the shampoo until then. So the girl wouldn't be back until Monday. Walton realized that this girl was going to miss three days of school unnecessarily. As a nurse, she wanted to help people and solve problems, but this problem wasn't really about the lice. Walton has given this a lot of thought. Quote, we have education advocates saying teachers aren't doing enough. We have teachers saying that parents aren't doing enough. 
Then you have the little school nurse over in the corner, like y'all are wrong. The problem in our school system is concentrated poverty, disadvantage, community violence. We send children who are housing insecure, hungry and tired into a school building. We throw them into the classroom with 32 other kids, one teacher, and then we give them Pop-Tarts and brownies for breakfast. Then we feed them an over-processed lunch while we deny them art and music. And we wonder why they're bouncing off the walls. A political science degree is not gonna help you figure that out. So she took her nursing insight and she ran for mayor as a democratic socialist. And, and, and as you and I've discussed, um, maybe a political science degree for nurses is actually not a bad thing at all. Um, yes. But um, realizing that you can be part of the decision making. And, and we're progressively seeing that. And I know here we've got, you know, the the Secretary of Health, the Director General of Health in, in my state is a nurse, um, Vice Chancellors are nurses, um, nurses are, we've got a couple of federal politicians. I know in the States you've got some absolutely splendid nurses in in um, in government now. And and really in many ways, I, I think we have to inhabit all of the layers if we're going to work up and down through the system. Um, <clears throat> you, and you I'm wondering have... if you think, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, I loved what you said about seeing near and seeing far, because I think that what, what India Walton was describing there was how she saw near. She saw the girl with the lice and she saw exactly what was happening there. And then she took yeah. that and she saw far. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's so important and such a good way to put it, because as you say, we do, we have several other nurses, for instance, Corey Bush, who was um, very instrumental in putting the cap on um, insulin in this country. Um, the people, you know, people with diabetes um, couldn't, could not afford their insulin. Um, and she was, she was very, very, um, that was one of the reasons that she ran because as a nurse, she saw people who lost limbs because they could not, or died because they couldn't afford insulin. Yeah. And then she got into power in order to do that kind of thing, which is just so, um, so much of, I think what we're talking about. Yeah. And I don't have the quote here, but I remember um, a passage in the, in the book where you talked about, um, that the issues of society, nurses see them written on the bodies of their patients. And I, I, you know, I, I just think that's just wonderful. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, what you're talking about now is actually the key to you talking about a love letter to nursing's possibilities. Um, I, I, I know you've said that you started writing this book as a history of nursing and then realised that wasn't the positioning that you wanted to take it to. So... Um, so, you know, that notion of a love letter to nursing's possibility, and then you say there's nothing more urgent than understanding the potential power um, of nursing right now. Um, what do you mean by that? And what are you challenging us to do? Yeah, well, I think I, I'm, I wouldn't just put it on nurses in, in terms of the action. I, I do think that nurses have absolutely essential knowledge and expertise that needs to play a bigger role in society in order for us all to have a chance to live happy, healthy lives. Um, I think that so much of the tremendous problems that we face all over the world right now are problems of caring, uh, problems of not seeing each other's humanity and 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 honoring each other's humanity. Um, and um, so I think what I'm saying here is, as you, as you pointed out, you know, I started out trying to write a straight ahead history of nursing for a general audience, because, of course, you know, nursing scholars have written many histories of of nursing. Um, and I quickly realized that, A, that was really impossible, that nursing is way too big for any one person to be able to write a history of nursing. Um, but also, I realized that what I really wanted to say was, and to point out was, look at what happens when people, look at, look at the power, the potential power of healthcare professionals who have this biomedical knowledge, but who also are so focused on relationships 
and knowing people in a holistic way, what kind of expertise is that? That is unique expertise. That is expertise that really nobody else has because other people have, you know, other kinds of important information, you know, social workers or physicians or, but nurses have an understanding of the body and of the person. And what would happen if we made decisions based on that? So, you know, I think about um, what we're talking about um, with Corey Bush or India Walton. And it's not that I think that nurses must run for office, um, but the idea of claiming your power because claiming your expertise and knowing how transformative that could be, how transformative that could be. I mean, it is, it is yeah. tremendously transformative. Um, yeah. because, you know, I was thinking about a certain, um, you know, you know I was thinking about actually there's probably many of you know about group prenatal care in the United States there's a there's a um an organization called Centering Pregnancy and I know in other countries midwives are sort of the first line um uh default uh provider for uncomplicated pregnancies in the United States it's OBGYNs so it's physicians a midwife um was working in Connecticut and she thought to herself and in, in the United States also, midwives are um, certified nurse midwives. So all midwives, m m the vast majority of midwives in the United States are also nurses. So she was working and she sort of thought to herself, you know, so many pregnant women have the same questions and she's answering these questions, um, but she's thinking they would really benefit from talking to each other. And so she came up with this idea of what if we had group prenatal care? So you have a cohort of people who are all due around the same time and you have your midwife. And there are checks that are done in private, so belly checks and um, doing the fetal heart reading. But then there is an hour where you sit with the midwife and they talk and they ask questions of the midwife. And so there's all kinds of different information and support. So there's peer-to-peer -peer support and information. There's expert support and information. and from this model, there is there is a, it is associated with a tremendous decrease actually in preterm birth, which is a terrible problem all over the world, and in particular here in the United States. What does that say, right? It says that this midwife saw what women needed, and she created a model that would address this terrible public health crisis. And you know, the next thing that unfortunately I have to say is that you know it it has been very difficult for it to find a foothold here because um the because there's so much money that is that is tied up in obstetrical care in the United States, and our outcomes are absolutely abysmal. Okay. Um, and so what I think about that's power that she had, you know, the power that she knew people and then she made something of it. Yeah, and and it's had the same waxing waning thing in Australia. Co centering pregnancy came here, and then you know it 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 gets power, and it, then it gets squashed. Um, we are very to um the end of our time and the beginning of some questions. So, um, really, very much on the point that you were just just making, Sarah. I I would like to invite you to um read. Uh, what I understand is your favourite passage. I know this is how we closed the last one, but I think it's utterly opposite to um, the topic of today's uh, session. So um, if you would, Sarah. Whether you are a nurse or not, imagine it. Imagine a world in which the conditions necessary for health are enjoyed by all people. Nurses have a unique ability to bring such a world to fruition if they choose it. The rest of us can help. We are not nurses, but we can remember that Neolithic boy whose vertebrae fused as he grew, whose community nevertheless did not let him die of starvation or infection. We can do that too. We can refuse to be ruled by the dark logic of domination, some cruel fantasy of survival of the fittest. We can choose something different, we can look to ethical nursing and we can emulate it. I carry in my body the transformative nursing care I have received. We can carry it, we can multiply it, we can pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Aisha, 
We're over to in be in your hands. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'm hoping that people can hear me. Am I back on? Yes. Wonderful. I mean, just absolutely wonderful. Um, those extracts and I tried not to put anything in the chat, but I did at one point put powerful, powerful words. And I know we've got a lot of claps and hearts and um, for everyone listening, please show your appreciation for that wonderful almost hour that we have just had to, yes, exactly, exactly. I, I mean it, I just, you will never hear a better conversation about our profession than we have just heard today, this evening. It is just absolutely so, so deep and meaningful to, it embodies everything that I feel personally as a nurse as part of my identity and to hear it being discussed and talked about in this way and valued is power in itself. So, I mean, Jill and Sarah, I just wish every nurse could listen to this and they can because we're recording it. Um, we've got a lot of thanks in here for the discussion that we've had and we've covered a number of points. We've gone back to Florence Nightingale again. This is really pivotal um, crucible in the setting of a series of events that we are really seeing come out to fruition. And, you know, um, Beck, Beck, and Middle, Beck Middleton has just said, thank you very much, great stimulating conversation. And I think this is the thing. We have not had such a stimulating conversation like this. We have it sometimes in certain quarters, but what we have here is this book that Sarah has written as a non-nurse that is stimulating that more widely. And then we talked about nurses, there it is, the book, um, <laughs> taking their power and public engagement and the the public ritual of clapping when that's not really what we wanted, but maybe it was what the public needed, but certainly we didn't. And the mismatch going on and um, the dominance of economic policy driving what is going on with our workforce rather than our workforce driving the economy and the economic policies. And that takes us to the well-being economy that will be the focus of our next book club later on in the year. And I love this bit, who is sacrificed? Who is sacrificed to save us? Oh, that, I mean, <laughs> that whole bit, I've written that, was it 2242? Because I want Hannah to go back to that little clip bit where that was talked about. <laughs> so, so, that clip is just brilliant. That just conversation that you just had. Devaluing nursing is devaluing patients' life. I mean, come on, people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the... Framing this, framing our purpose and what nursing is doing, there are some amazing quotes in this book that you can take forward with you that will give you power. And Jill was talking about we've got to inhabit all the layers. You know, where are nurses positioned? And look at what happens when people um, bring together this biomedical knowledge and the relationships. And I've written down art and science you know, the art and science of nursing, which is what I remember from my education. And I think maybe that is perhaps missing for our, from our education now, the acknowledgement that there is this joining of these two things together that make our contribution very unique. So I want to just hand over, sorry. sorry, Jill. Well, I, just on that point, um, one of the things that, that I, my, one of my conceptions of nursing and why our voice is so important is that we hold the cumulative story of patients' experience of health and health care. And that has to go in, that has to inform policy if policy is going to work. Absolutely, absolutely. The engagement with the public, that I, I can't agree with you more not understanding what it is that nursing is and nursing does. And there are these portrayals of us in really quite bizarre ways, um, manufactured by the media, the press, stories, you know, etc. cetera. Um, but I really want to just see if there's any um, 
questions. I, I know there's a few of our nurses um, here. Thank you a lot. This is just the most recent one. Timely titles and content plus discussion. Health, economics, cultural humility, sociology of nursing and sociology of nursing entrepreneurship, self-care, all combined and should be nurses' academic preparation for the future of work. Such an amazing hour, Abigail. She's a Canadian nurse in Edinburgh at the moment, was in the class today. Um, listening to you both explore these very poignant and important discussions. Thank you. And I think this is a bit, our early career nurses need to, to be part of these conversations because myself and Jill are a different generation and we want, we still want to hear this. We This is the conversations we want to have to happen. And for our early career nurses to hear this and engage with this is so fundamental because they are they are the now, they are the future, and they will be the inspiration for the next generation coming. Therefore, we have to engage in these conversations. So I'm going to leave it there unless we have got any questions in the chat. Sarah, you please say the last word. We're not strict on time here. Oh, I don't need to have the last word, but I, well, I just want to say thank you so much. And also, you know, something that comes up for me in these conversations a lot when I speak with nurses and I'm, it, um, people are often surprised that I have been, that I was interested in writing about nurses. And I always think to myself, you know, there are so many stories and so many books written about physicians and other scientists and it, this should not be surprising I understand why it is but it really shouldn't be and the other thing that always comes to mind is what a natural alliance it is the public and nurses um, and what an opportunity that could be because I do think that um, so many of the problems we have in our healthcare system is about the public feeling very much like you go in, it's, it's an inhuman labyrinth. You know, you aren't, you, you are, you are having to leave so much behind. Um, and I just, you know, if people knew the research that says that the more nurses you have, the more likely you are to be discharged alive from the hospital. And that's just speaking in a hospital setting, you know, I, um, I, I just, I just think that there's such a, an opportunity for the public and for nurses to understand each other better and to have an alliance because the power of that to sort of change all of these systems. Um, I think that there's a lot of potential there. Definitely. Building and we're, that not, we're not without evidence of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the Linda Aiken work, um, Anne-Marie, Dame Anne-Marie Rafferty, um, and the European nurses, I mean, the Queensland um, absolute, you know, economic outcome in relation to, and proof in relation to safe staffing. So mm -hmm. it's, we're not without evidence, but evidence alone does not change policy. So where's the grunt? And it's the community, it's the relationship mm -hmm. with the public that, and politicians that has to be the grunt. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think that's that's where we need to, to move to, building on that capital to give us agency. And politicians are um, often very fickle and um, are very interested in the next election and what the public feeling is, etc. And that definitely does influence. And I think we just have assumed that people understand who we are, but we know ourselves as nurses. When people look at us and speak to us, they see an angel, they see Florence, they see, they, they see one they see us through a lens that is not an accurate, um, it's not accurate as to what we are and who we are. And I think that's where that discussion and dialogue has to happen. And if we can do that, then we will start to regain our power, I think, for sure. I think Barbara has put, Sarah, I am happy to connect for global contacts IHCNO has a number of global contacts, including members of our board. So we'll put you in touch with each other. I'm not sure what all that means, but it sounds interesting and positive. Um, Jill, did and you want to the, end? Yeah, just, what, I mean, just following on what you were saying, um, one of the things that, that I always say to students and nurses in any forum 
is that I would never, ever presume to tell you how to vote, but I absolutely would presume to tell you to vote thoughtfully mm -hmm. and to have looked at the health, the education and the domestic violence and social policies of everyone that you might vote for and mm -hmm. go and have a conversation yeah. with your yeah. representatives yeah. after you've been informed about those policies. Mm -hmm. And then you can have a knowledgeable conversation bringing what you know of the health consequences for mm -hmm. people and the possibilities mm -hmm. of those policies, whichever flavour of the person is that you're talking to. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you think how many nurses there are globally, if we all read those policies pre-election and had those conversations, I think we've got extraordinary right. opportunity. Now. We have. And we have to ask ourselves, is that part of the reason? There are 29.1 million nurses. And that's that's maybe an underestimate because we know nurses are, there are so many definitions of nursing, but currently 29.1 million out of a workforce of 65 million. That is, you know, it's the biggest group. We are the biggest group. And, you know, we have the potential. And, you know, these early career nurses on this call and listening to this book club, um, you are it and we are here to support you. In, in in our in our in our march forward together so i'm just going to draw things to a close here thank you so much everybody um i love izzy there's izzy she's our emres student in edinburgh Burdett fellow looking at nursing and policy and political leadership nursing is just never spoken about in this way and it should be a very thought-provoking discussion thank you and um Zuhara said, I genuinely appreciate the fact that you acknowledge the impact of nurses. This is refresh, refreshing to see and experience. Thank you for such an inspiring talk. Okay, you've heard it here. So please go and tell others, listen to this. And thank you so much. Loved the book. That was Carol Treston. So Sarah, you're doing wonderful work and just such an honour. Jill and Sarah to um to listen to you both and uh, to be part of it very humbling I'm sure we've all experienced something very special this evening and we are recording so we will be able to share this further and keep talking about this conversation and Sarah I I thank the day I tweeted you or dm'd you whatever you call it <laughs> when when your book came out say we must have you to come and talk to us because We've gained a friend and a colleague for life in you, and we are so very grateful. And Jill, thank you so much for your absolutely wonderful, wonderful hosting and really delving deep into this conversation with Sarah. It's just a thing of beauty to listen to and be part of. Thank you, everyone, wherever you are, morning, noon, evening or night. Um, see you soon. And our second um, book club will be happening around about May time, I think with Catherine Trebek talking about the well-being economy. So something that all nurses should be involved in. So we're hoping to engage you in between this time. Please utilize the book that Sarah has. Let share the, the link to this discussion, share it with your universities, your colleagues, your public, your family. <laughs> sit down, <laughs> sit down together as a family and with your friends and say, this is nursing. This is it. It will challenge what you think about things. Send it to journalists, send it to TV shows, send it to people and tell them this is the thing we want to talk about. And, um, oh, I love this. This last one is the end, really. <laughs> Jill, Sarah, Aisha, thank you for your time and commitment to advancing this noble profession. We love you. Anu Wapa, Lagos, Nigeria. How fantastic is that? Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, good evening, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and see you all soon. Take care, and thank you to the Nursing Now Challenge um, team, Amy and Hannah there behind the scenes, and Kate um, in the background also, who's not with us anymore. Thank you all, everyone, and to my wonderful students from Edinburgh for joining, and to everyone else. Um, please keep, keep supporting Nursing Now Challenge, and we will see you very soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.